This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Tonight we turn our attention to Darwin's legacy in the social sciences. And we're pleased to have with us not only one of the leading scholars today in this effort, Professor Melissa Brown, but we are also pleased that tonight's scholar is a Stanford colleague and an assistant professor at that. We all look forward to Professor Brown's insights. It's especially appropriate to turn tonight to the social sciences as we've now had a couple of weeks in a row on the natural sciences, first with Peter and Rosemary Grant of Princeton, as you remember, on the Finches of Galapagos, and last week with Dr. Niles Eldridge of the American Museum of Natural History on the vertebrate fauna that led Darwin to the discovery of the Tree of Life. It's interesting, too, that the Grant's talk emphasized one of Darwin's blockbuster ideas, natural selection, and Eldridge emphasized the other blockbuster idea, the tree of life, the relationship of descent. It seems to me that Professor Eldridge opened our eyes in new ways to a couple of observations about Darwin's work related to the tree of life. The first could be called Darwin's theory of replacement, that during the Beagle's time in the southern cone, of South America, Darwin became fascinated by the replacement in space and time of one species by another or by several similar species. Eldridge mentioned three especially important examples from Darwin's discovery of fossils in Bahia Blanca in Argentina in 1832, barely nine months into the voyage. Imagine that, this young fellow sets off and nine months into the voyage, he finds himself at an important and fascinating fossil bed where he finds first a large extinct glyptodon, an armored mammalian herbivore about the same size as a Volkswagen bug, replaced in today's fauna, thinks Darwin, by armadillos. Secondly, he finds in Bahia Blanca a large extinct megatherium, a large ground sloth, which again is the size of an African male elephant replaced in today's fauna by smaller arboreal sloths in South America. The third example was that small caviamorph rodent um, that Eldridge described that Darwin thought must be congeneric with the Patagonian cavi, and it's replaced in the south by that species. Darwin also found in those fossil beds at Bahia Blanca a group of fossil mollusks that persisted unmodified over the same time span up to the present. This pattern of replacement with a control group of mollusks and three replacement examples did four things for Darwin when you stop to think about it. First, it confirmed extinction for Darwin in a really dramatic example. You know, imagine a large Volkswagen-sized armadillo. Whew. That's, that's enough to convince you of extinction. Secondly, the location of fossil layers in the strata suggested the antiquity of living forms, that there were layers of strata that Darwin thought added up to tell a story through time. Thirdly, the persistence of the mollusks across those strata suggested that the extinction of the megatherium and the glyptodon was not a matter of a catastrophe, or else the mollusks too would have gone extinct. That the extinction applied to some, but not to others, is what the mollusks said. And fourth, the replaced pairs suggested a descent relationship. Today's species replace as if descended from similar species of the past. All of this, while Darwin was still in South America, was Eldridge's message in the first year of the voyage. Moreover, noted Niles last week, Darwin was told by the gauchos of the Argentinian Pampas of another instance of replacement that just south of Bahia Blanca on that river, the Rio Negro, North of the river lives the greater Rhea, the big ostrich-like bird. South of the Rio Negro lives the lesser Rhea. And you'll remember Eldridge telling us that wonderful story, Beagle hunters captured, uh, cooked, and ate much of the lesser Rhea for Christmas dinner before it dawned on Darwin that this was an yet another instance of replacement, the lesser Rhea replacing the greater Rhea. Darwin rescued the bones and sculled the ship back to Henslow with other specimens. Eldridge suggested, and Darwin himself confirms in the opening sentence of his 1859 big book, that these facts led him early on to ponder the mutability of species. Well, when did that ponder begin? 
As Eldridge pointed out, Darwin received Lyell's Principles of Geology, Volume 2, in November of 1832, soon after the Bahia Blanca fossils. In Volume 2, moreover, Lyell recaps the arguments, all the arguments made uh, prior to that time, for the transmutation of species, and concludes, I quote, no facts of transmutation authenticated. Having just found all of these replacements, some living, some fossil, and a mollusk control group, Eldridge suggests that Darwin began a kind of imaginary debate with Lyell over exactly that point of species transmutation. So this week I went back and looked at Darwin's animal notes from the Beagle dating to 1833. Holy smokes, what an interesting thing. One finds a page after page of Darwin listing replacements. For example, the prairie dog is replaced by other prairie dogs at different altitudinal bands, notes Darwin. The guanaco is replaced by other camelids. The cavi is replaced by the Patagonian cavi. The tucutucu, the little rodent, looks a lot like a guinea pig, is replaced by various species. Armadillos show replacement. The blue fox shows replacement. And then there's another list in 1833 for the birds that Darwin felt showing replacement. So this is all right after reading Lyell's book. And then, as Eldridge noted, the mockingbirds of Galapagos, Handley in 1835, Handley fit into the picture. As we talked the very first night, Darwin noticed they replaced one another on the different islands. Replacement then, an idea intimately linked to mobility and descent, was thus definitely on Darwin's mind in 1832, two years before Galapagos, which brings me briefly to Eldridge's second worthy point. For years, scholars have suggested, and Eldridge was one of them, that Darwin acted inductively in a Baconian manner in his voyage of discovery, amassing facts. You read about it in the book, following the patterns of Bacon, amassing facts that then revealed patterns and then suggested regularities and principles in nature. Eldridge, in his second point last week, challenged that view. Darwin's notes reveal they had a hypothesis in mind from 1832 onward namely that similar species replace each other in space and time. You don't find them together, they replace one another, and they appear to be connected. This hypothesis appears to have organized his notes and probably even his data collection. Far from working inductively, noted Eldridge, Darwin is a good example of hypothesis testing. As Eldridge put it last week, Darwin was thinking experimentally, testing predictions, and that runs against everything you'll read in the history books. So I think Eldridge did a marvelous job, full of implications for our understanding of Darwin and Darwin's legacy. Carol. And as we move on, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Melissa Brown tonight. Uh, Professor Brown, as Bill mentioned, is an assistant professor in anthropology at Stanford University. So we're really delighted on multiple accounts that she was able to come tonight. She also has affiliations in the Center for East Asian Studies and in the Program in Human Biology, among other places, uh, and in fact teaches in the core of the Program in Human Biology, as many of the students, undergraduate students in the audience will be aware. Her research group studies how social and cultural change moves across communities and larger populations. So it's looking at a very broad scale, how social change and how cultural change is transmitted, is, is moves across uh, the landscape. She works primarily in China and Taiwan, and her research actually has three articulated goals, a theoretical goal, a regional goal and a methodological, methodological goal. Not all of us are quite that organized, so this is pretty impressive. Uh, her theoretical goal is to explore whether there are generalizable and predictable, importantly, processes of social and cultural change. Can we say anything about what is going to happen to a particular society in the future? She uses, focuses on identity, on women's labor, on marriage, and on social and coevolutionary theory when she's doing this research. At a regional scale, she's analyzing the vast changes that have happened in China and Taiwan over the 20th century, which have indeed been tremendous, in order to contribute to a better understanding of the challenges 
and the part of the world in the 21st century. Now, given the numbers of people in that part of the world, their impact on what happens to the rest of us is going to be huge in the 21st century, and this makes it all the more important to understand what's likely to proceed. Her methodological goal is to develop and promote scientific approaches to ethnographic research. Now, if you're like me, when you came into this and you didn't know very much about anthropology, you tended to think of ethnographies as something that people did back in the 1800s and that were essentially just case studies that didn't particularly have an outcome or a point. And one of the things that Professor Brown is interested in is how to use ethnographies and ethnographic studies in a way that furthers our understanding of the processes of cultural and social change across a landscape. Now, in the process of doing all of this, she's published a number of books. One of them is an edited volume that came out in 2008 called Examining Culture Scientifically, which speaks to her interdisciplinary interests. In 2004, she published Is Taiwan Chinese? The Impact of Culture, Power, and Migration on Changing Identities. And in the 1990s, she published an edited volume on negotiating ethnicities in China and Taiwan. So all of these relate to the processes of cultural evolution, of societal evolution, which she's going to talk about tonight. Melissa? Well, thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Carol, and thank you to Bill and to the committee for inviting me to be here. It's certainly an honor to be among such illustrious company as, you've, uh, as the others you've had speaking to you. Let me get this. Yes. Okay. Now, we're all Darwin fans here. So part of what I'm going to do tonight is to try and help us think a little bit about why Darwin isn't more widely accepted in the social sciences today. Um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that at the beginning, and then I'm going to shift into talk about some of the evolutionary-oriented work that is being done. So, <clears throat> excuse me, anthropology is a disparate uh, field, uh, the f traditional four field approach. I'm going to be focusing on sociocultural anthropology and thinking about the responses of sociocultural anthropologists and sociologists um, who, who share the, the, the closest kinship uh, intellectually of these different schools. And in particular, what I want to start with is thinking about, about the cult of Darwin and the way that Darwin is viewed. One of the things that I tell uh, students when reading Darwin is that if you come from a sociological tradition, from a sociocultural anthropology tradition, if you read any Darwin at all, what you probably read is The Descent of Man. Um, and that's it. If you are a biology student, by contrast, or a physical anthropology student, um, and you if you read any Darwin at all in the course of your early studies, you probably read the first edition of The Origin of Species. And that's it. And so that difference in what people read is tremendously important, as, as I'm going to take a moment to think about here, because you get very idif different ideas of who Darwin was and what his methods were, um, how good a scientist he was, um, in, and how he related to other people, and how he thought about data relating to human beings, depending on which of those that you read. In The Origin of Species, which is the first edition which is often held up as a hallmark of the scientific method, um, he goes to great lengths of presenting detailed evidence of data he's collected himself in all kinds of different situations. This is just one of many of the experimental type of data that, that Darwin collected. In this particular case, <clears throat> he was talking about how um, there were, he was looking at enclosures on uh, Heath uh, and how enclosing something led to the development or to the growth of all of these different plants that were attempting to grow all this time, but when it was unenclosed, cows would come and chew them down. And he, he at one point, as he talks about here, he actually stops and counts, right? He gives us quantitative data. 
in one square yard at a point some hundred yards distant from one of the old clumps, um, meaning one of the old ancient clumps of, of trees. I counted 32 little trees, and one of them, judging from the rings of growth, had during 26 years tried to raise its head above the stems of the heath and had failed. Um, no wonder that as soon as the land was enclosed, it became thickly clothed with vigorously growing young firs. So he's made a statement about the way in which um, environmental pressure, the, the feeding of the cows, has affected um, what grows on the heath and the fact that there are no trees except in these enclosure areas. And then he gives us quantitative data that he's collected himself empirically to support this. Great science. By contrast, in The Descent of Man, which is the thing that most sociological students would take a look at, he has a very different approach. This is from the chapter in which he's discussing race, in which he's thinking about um, the extinction of different groups of human beings, um, and in which he's considering the ways in which extinctions are caused um, and how, that, um, how change in the environment impacts human beings. And he notes, just before he comes to this passage, he's talking about Tasmania when it was first colonized, excuse me, <clears throat> when it was first colonized by Europeans, and that there were initial estimates that there were between 7,000 or 20,000 native Tasmanians. And then Darwin writes, their number was soon greatly reduced, chiefly by fighting with the English and with each other. After the famous hunt by all the colonists, when the remaining natives delivered themselves up to the government, they consisted only of 120 individuals who were in 1930, or excuse me, 1832 transported to Flinders Island, 40 miles long and from 12 to 18 miles broad. It seems healthy and the natives were well treated. Nevertheless, they suffered greatly in health. Darwin, Darwin goes on to wonder about the reasons for the extinction of the Tasmanians. He, gives us, he does give us some numbers about the numbers of men, women, and children in different years. Um, as you can see, it goes dramatically down 111, 100. Uh, by 1847, there's only 46. And by 1864, there's only four individuals left. Um, and, but Darwin's assessment, even though he mentions the, um, that there are some other scholars who think that their death followed attempts to civilize them, quote unquote, or that it was the change of living in food and primarily their banishment that caused this extinction, Darwin's assessment is that many of the wilder races of men are apt to suffer much in health when subjected to changed conditions or habits of life. Mere alterations in habits, which do not appear injurious in themselves, seem to have the same effect. These are passages that when sociological students read them are appalling. Um, the way in which that, that Darwin doesn't seem to recognize the impact that a hunt of human beings by other human beings would have on the survivors. Um, that he, he, he seems to gloss over the ways in which he says they don't appear injurious in themselves. These, these raise hackles um, among sociological students who read them. Darwin goes on to think about this in terms of um, what the qualities of different racial groups are more broadly, and he says um, that it has often been said that man can resist with impunity the greatest diversities of climate and other changes, but this is true only of the civilized races. Man in his wild condition seems to be in this respect almost as susceptible as his nearest allies, the anthropoid apes, which have never yet survived long when removed from their native country. So, Darwin, who in the first edition of Origin is such a brilliant, uses such brilliant logic and uses such reliable data, um, here even there, there appear to be logic problems. He, he doesn't think about um, if it's only civil, quote unquote civilized races, by which he generally means Europeans, who are the ones who can move out of the area in which they, they 
um, are accustomed to, then how did we get the people in, of the world before there were European civilizations? How did the, the Inuit and their ancestors adapt to the Arctic? Um, and it also doesn't take into consideration the parts of the world that European colonizers were decimated by diseases um, when they colonized in parts of Africa, um, parts of Asia, uh, and elsewhere. So <clears throat> these, this difference in the parts of Darwin that one reads leaves people with very different impressions of him, either as a brilliant scientist um, or as a Victorian gentleman who showed the racism of his time and place. Now, the challenge for us is that, of course, Darwin was both. Um, and, and in trying to put back together again, <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> in trying to put back together again an understanding of him, we have to see him as as the with the full picture. <coughs> now, within evolutionary perspectives, people are going back to Darwin's um, Descent of Man book. Um, in which he also discover, or discusses the concept of sexual selection and are saying, you know, yes, I, people who are evolutionists, who are evolutionary biologists are saying, you know, we need to rethink the way in which Darwin has presented some of these ideas and to rethink what sexual selection in particular is. This is just one example. This is a very prominent example. Joan Roughgarden, who is a very prominent evolutionary biologist here at Stanford, has recently published a book, Evolution's Rainbow, and she has another one coming out soon called The Genial Gene, in which she's taking on this Darwinian notion of sexual selection and saying, you know, Darwin's presentation and, and uh, formulation that what females are really doing is searching for the best male and that you get, as a result, sort of aggressive philandering males and coy females is, is really kind of naive. And that if you look across the range of species, in, in Rough Garden's Evolution's Rainbow book, I think she's got about 300 different species that she gives examples from, that it's more complicated than that. That very simple kind of model doesn't seem to fit well the empirical data that we have now. Now that doesn't mean she's throwing out Darwin. It doesn't mean she's saying that Darwin um, it, it should that Darwinian theory and that evolutionary theory is wrong. She's just saying we need to look more carefully at the data and and rethink parts of these, um, arguing that we should be going uh, looking at cooperation <clears throat> rather than competition. So how did this happen? How did Darwin go from writing such a brilliant scientific treatise in the first edition of Origin to something that was more understandably a product of his time and place in the descent? He was most definitely influenced by his peers. And um, Herbert Spencer, uh, uh, one of the early sociologists, um, Lubbock and others, McClellan, Maine, Morgan, there's a number of, of uh, evolutionary thinkers who could be mentioned. And as I'll talk about in just a moment, these were people who thought of evolution somewhat differently than Darwin did. In particular, Spencer's no, Spencer was the one who came up with the concept of survival of the fittest. This was something that was not in Darwin's first edition of Origin of Species. It didn't appear until the second edition. Um, and it shifted the way in which the emphasis in the discussion about the concept of natural selection to suddenly talk about it as survival of the fittest. And it really is somewhat akin to the, the the person who probably most summarizes the view that Spencer was putting forward is the character Ebenezer Scrooge from the Charles Dickens play, uh, or from the Charles Dickens novel, A Christmas Carol, where the point at which, um, and, and this is from the classic movie with Alistair Sims playing Ebenezer Scrooge, this is Herbert Spencer up here, um, the, the, the classic line where the two gentlemen from a charity come and request uh, Scrooge to make a donation and he says, well, let them go to the poorhouse and they say, well, most people would rather die than go to the poorhouse and he says, well, let them die then and decrease the surplus population. Um, it's that kind of 
attitude that was associated with this concept of survival of the fittest that Spencer and others had promoted before Darwin published Origin of Species in the first place. And that idea comes out of the larger notion of evolution of, at the time, this concept of evolution as a potential, um, of an unfolding of a predestined outcome. Um, this was something that, that goes back to uh, centuries of thought, really, if you go back to the Scala Naturae, uh, which is pictured over here, that there's this scale, the natural scale, from the lowly critters all the way up through various forms of animals and humanity, uh, to the angels, and finally to God. Um, and that with this scaling, um, each level, of course, was presumed to be better than the scale below it. Um, and each scale was presumed to be unfolding what was inherent in it, what, what its potential was. So you get this sense of stages of development, and there were other scholars approximately around this time, both before and shortly after Darwin, who were writing about these stages in terms of human societies. Uh, Sir Henry Maine had done some of this, perhaps more famous is Lewis Henry Morgan uh, in the United States, who talked about stages of civilization, from savage, lo um, lower, middle, and upper savagery, to barbarism, and at last to civilization. And he linked, Morgan linked each of these to what was going on in terms of the technology. Oh, you've got a bow and arrow, that's upper savagery. Um, you've got pottery, that's lower barbarism. Um, domestication, well, that's middle barbarism. I mean, he had specific stages. And the presumption was that human beings and human societies moved through these stages and progressed up this natural scale um, and went on. Now, some of the more liberal thinkers of this time, like uh, E.B. Tyler, had a concept of psychic unity where they thought that human beings, even if they were at different stages, all had the same cognitive capacity. They just hadn't gone as far in the unfolding of their destiny. That was rather a liberal view at the time. There were other scholars who had a very different view and had a decidedly more, um, what as we'll see, became a sinister view that people at different scales, at quote unquote lower scales, were actually lower in cognitive ability. And this is where um, some of the reaction that we still see today comes from the, the links that are presumed between Darwin and eugenics. Um, eugenics was uh, founded by Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, uh, with an 1869 book called Hereditary Genius. It was extremely popular among people who were highly prominent and well-respected in their day. Um, in a, Sir uh, Winston Churchill, for example, actually proposed um, laws in Britain based on uh, eugen the eugenics writing of Galton. And it was only stopped in Britain because uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton managed to, to not allow it to go through. He managed to put together the power in the parliament to vote it down. In the US, by contrast, those laws passed. Um, Charles Davenport was uh, the head of the eugenics record office that was funded by the Carnegie Institute. Um, there are Stanford ties to eugenics. Uh, Lewis Terman, who's the Stanford of the, the inventor of the Stanford Binet IQ test. Those IQ tests were part of the eugenics movement. Um, David Starr Jordan, the former president of Stanford, was on the, com the chair of the Committee of Eugenics for the American Breeders Association. William Sumner, who was the founder of the American Sociological Society, which later became the American uh, Sociological Association, was also part of this. Margaret Sanger, um, who founded Planned Parenthood, um, was also part of this. So you can see from Galton and Churchill and Jordan, Sanger over here and Davenport, people who were highly prominent people were part of this movement. And the, the point of the eugenics movement was to promote the fitness of the population. Um, and in fact, to specifically to see that the unfit became, were sterilized so they would not contribute to it, and to promote births by those considered fit. Now, Drawing on Spencer, um, those who were fit, of course, was highly linked to race and to economic class. Um, and 
training that was done for a social work was founded in order to um, to identify people who were supposedly mentally degenerate, quote unquote. Some of the training for this took 15 minutes. Um, and then they were sent out to make judgments that would affect people's lives. The initial targets in the early part of the 20th century were for Jews and Irish and Italians, who in the early 20th century weren't considered white. Later in the century, they were targeted Spanish-speaking peoples, uh, African Americans, Native Americans. Um, they, in the 1920s, the American eugenics societies went to state fairs. Um, they put on uh, exhibits like this that talked about some people are born to be a burden on the rest. Each of these lights is supposed to flash every so many seconds and to point out um, people who are, uh, let's see, on the left here, there are uh, those who are going to never be above the mental capability of an eight-year-old child. Um, then they go through uh, various degrees of this and on the right where you only flash every seven minutes, um, so a lot less frequently as someone who's really going to be a good person. So they want people to learn about this so that they can correct it. Um, and they did a number of things to bring this to people. They had better baby contests down here. These are finalists in the Better Baby, Con Better Baby Contest in New York. I think that was in 1924. Um, fit the Fitter Family Contest. This was a family that was considered, you see over here it says um, Governor's Trophy, uh, Fittest Family. This one I think was from uh, I think this was from Kansas, 1920. Um, and then there's another one from Texas where there you can see a smaller version of the light up sign uh, indicating to people what's going on. Um, and even cartoons, you must have a eugenics certificate. This had real impacts on medical research, for example. Um, Dr. Joseph Goldberger found as early as 1915 that the disease pellagra, um, and these are, uh, this is an example of what can happen with the disease pellagra, um, is really not something, it's not something that needs to happen. It's a nutrition deficiency. With niacin um, treatments, as this girl got, um, you can have complete recovery. But in 1915, when Goldberger presented evidence that pellagra was a nutritionary deficiency, um, he got uh, uh, voted down at the, the meeting at which he, he presented this, and eugenicists argued that really um, pellagra was the result of the bad genes of the poor and evidence that such people ought to be sterilized. The U.S. passed a number of laws requiring compulsory sterilization of people deemed unfit. Uh, Carrie Buck, uh, who is pictured, um, the younger woman pictured here, fought this compulsory order for herself all the way to the Supreme Court in 1927. Uh, people had decided that she, her mother had a mental age of eight, supposedly, from one of these IQ tests. Her seven-month-year-old daughter was deemed not quite normal. Um, and they were institutionalized. This photo is from the Virginia Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded from 1924. The Supreme Court in 1927, Oliver Wendell Holmes penned the decision, and he said that um, uh, he has a long, uh, description of which he's saying, you know, we need to take into account the good of society and we have to take all this very seriously. And at the end, he concludes with three generations of imbeciles is enough. Carrie Buck lost and was forcibly sterilized. What a lot of people don't know is that the sterilization laws in the U.S. by World War II, 30 of the 48 U.S. states had such compulsory sterilization laws. In the United States by 1968, about 65,000 people were compulsorily sterilized. And in 1992, there were 22 of the states still had these laws on the books. Now, between 2002 and 7, five different states have apologized, including California. Um, Gray Davis did that when he was governor. But the Nazi laws, eugenics laws, that more people are a little bit more familiar with were based on the U.S. laws. And indeed, they especially looked at the laws and the way they were implemented in California because California was responsible for about one-third of the total number of sterilizations. And the Nazis looked most closely at California because they saw this as evidence that they could implement sterilization at a mass level. 
Um, and so in, in the, uh, the German poster down here, this was a Nazi era um, uh, poster promoting sterilization and the flags that are all on there, what it says is we're not alone and the flags are the flags of all the countries in the world that had compulsory sterilization laws on the books at the time. Um, this leads to the kind of photo, I didn't Photoshop that image, I found it on the web, um, of Darwin and Hitler. And this is a position that a lot of people, not just creationists, but also humanists within academics take, that they think that um, these kinds of outcomes of eugenics are as a direct result of Darwin and it strongly cover colors their opinion of him. Um, these kinds of uh, sterilization laws still go on in the present. Between 1990 and 2000 in Peru, um, Alberto Fujimori pressured sterilization of over 200,000 rural people in Peru. Um, so these are, are issues that are still faced today. In anthropology particularly, American anthropology was founded virtually against evolutionary thinking. Um, Franz Boas, who is considered the founder of American anthropology and one of his very prominent students, Margaret Mead, were both um, highly involved in the public and in research to disprove the kinds of positions that eugenicists took. Um, they advocated historical particularism and cultural determinism. So this is the view that a lot of sociologists and anthropologists have of Darwin. And one of the challenges that um, I and I think other colleagues also face in trying to present to colleagues, well, I'm using Darwinian theory, I'm using neo-Darwinian theory, then you have to have this five-minute spiel where you say, no, I'm not a eugenicist, no, I don't think that, that, that genetics determines behavior with, with no other influence, no, I don't, no, I don't, and this is why. I mean, these are real fears because these were real lives that were terribly affected. So I want to shift now and think, given that backdrop, what kinds of evolutionary perspectives have gone on in the social sciences more recently? Um, in particular, I'm going to be looking at, at since the 1970s. And I'm going to break it down a little bit differently than in the Kevin Leyland and Jillian Brown book, Sense and Nonsense, which was recommended. Um, for, actually, I'd recommend you read the whole book if you have a chance at some point, and uh, was required reading for the students for, for parts of this. <clears throat> One of the ways that I like to think of this is as the, the part that I've just been talking about, as I said earlier, is evolution as potential, right? The potential for this unfolding, um, for something that's already predetermined to, to come out or not. Now this next set of um, views, think more of evolution as a legacy. The idea that humans bear the imprint of, our, of genetic evolution in most of our behavior. And this was really advanced not so much by, a, or at least got the initial um, push by Conrad Lawrence and others working in the field of ethology Lawrence did the work on imprinting. You can see him here with uh, uh, ducks following him who have imprinted on him. Um, and he won a Nobel Prize with two other colleagues in 1973 for the way in which they looked at, um, at the, how imprinting and similar kinds of innate, uh, behave, or innate instincts come out in behavior. They were looking at this uh, process of how it's triggered ontogenetically in an, in an individual um, organism. Lawrence also went further. In his book on aggression, he turned to talking about human beings, and he argued that fighting and war are the natural expression of human instinctive aggression. Um, and so this was something that sparked some disagreement that sparked a lot of interest uh, and really I think got the ball moving again as people started to think more about um, the impact of genetic evolution on human behavior. Now one of the things that Lawrence assumed as others in this area tend to is that much of human behavior is or once was adaptive. 
uh, and we'll talk more about that as we go on, and what, what that means to think about human behavior as adaptive. The way in which this really hit um, anthropology and sociology in, in, in the United States, particularly in a big way, was with um, sociobiology. Uh, E.O. Wilson's 1975 book called Sociobiology sort of marked the explosion of this way of thinking on to the U.S. scene. Um, his colleague at the time at Harvard, Robert Trivers, um, also contributed greatly to this. There are a number of other scholars who did, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about their work. Um, one of the things that they did was they shifted from the ethologist. The ethologists had been taking a more psychological perspective where they looked at the <clears throat> ontogenetic uh, expression of certain kinds of instincts. And the sociobiologists turned to thinking about the functional significance of behavior. So looking at more at, um, at current human behavior, at its current function, and assuming that this that this behavior in its current function is currently adaptive, that, therefore that it, it provides current fitness benefits. Now, some of the key concepts associated with this, with thinking about um, applying this kind of a perspective to human beings and coming up with hypotheses that one would want to investigate, um, some of them you're a little familiar with. This is Richard Dawkins and his book, The Selfish Gene, which Dan Dennett talked about uh, in a fair amount of detail, I understand, so I'm, I'm not going to go into it too much. But I just want to repeat the point that this is the idea that it's, it's our genes that are pushing us to do what we do, that we're just the gene carriers. Um, we're the way of getting our genes to be passed on. Um, and all the other things that we do fit into that goal of our selfish genes to see themselves passed on. Um, this is one kind of way of looking at human behavior that sociobiologists used. Another very important way was thinking about the concept of kin selection. And this goes back to work by the geneticist W.D. Hamilton in thinking about um, the coefficient of relatedness and what that, how being related to different individuals impacts your behavior has to do with the way in which you want to not only pass on the genes that you have copies of, but you also want to see the genes that you share with your kin passed on as well. So this points out, you don't, you don't need to worry about the math, but the, the point coming down to that on this side we've got birds who are full cousins. And these two full cousins are going to share um, one eighth of their genes. Um, these are birds that are full siblings and they're going to share half of their genes. So um, I've, I've heard this uh, uh, apocryphal story now attributed to W.H. W.D. Hamilton. I've also heard it, heard it attributed to Sewell Wright, but one uh, population geneticist is reported to have quipped at a, at a um, cocktail party that he would lay down his life for two siblings or eight cousins. Um, and that's sort of the, the off-the-cuff way of thinking about it, right? Um, and while that sounds a little silly, the, the, um, the squirrel down here is to remind us that critters, there are critters that do that, right? That um, risk death to themselves, for example, in making a call when a predator comes near. Um, and the theoretical explanation for it from this perspective is that they actually get um, higher inclusive fitness by protecting the, the kin, those that they're related to, um, than they do by protecting just themselves. Um, so this is something that was turned to human beings in thinking of ways in which humans might favor nepotistic kinds of behavior in all kinds of social interactions, um, a number of other kinds of views. Another key concept that sociobiology looked at was issues relating to parental investment theory and parent-offspring conflict. Now this was something that, that Trivers in particular worked on, um, and it brought together the concept of inclusive fitness, of life history theory, and of sexual selection. Now the idea of parental investment theory is that in sexually reproducing species, 
females put a lot of investment into any one particular offspring. Uh, with pregnancy, lactation, uh, juvenile provisioning um, for mammals, right? Uh, whereas males put little investment into any one offspring. Uh, primarily, it's thought in terms of sperm. From this difference in investment, uh, parental investments theory suggests that females will be more selective in the choice of their partner, that they will want the quote unquote best male. Um, this also, as I said, drew on sexual selection in Darwin, as we, as we mentioned before. Males, in this perspective, will be more competitive and display more opportunism in their choice of partners, wanting as many females as possible. Hence, the differences in the <clears throat> views of him and her in this cartoon. Um, now, one problem with this, obviously, is that as I pointed out earlier, Rough Garden is suggesting that this does not necessarily accurately reflect the uh, many species in, in, that occur in the wild. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, parent um, offspring conflict has to do, if you think back to what we were just looking at, <clears throat> in terms of the correlation of relationships, a parent only shares half its genes with a child. So there's going to be, according to this theory, a, a tension between um, protecting the interests of the parent, him or herself, herself, usually they talk about it in terms of mothers and provisioning most often, um, and the needs of one child is against other child, children, whether the other children are present or whether they're future children that the mother could bear. And so that these are conflicts that will arise, for example, in provisioning of particularly demanding offspring. <coughs> now, <clears throat> there's usually not too much um, uh, qualms when people raise these kinds of thoughts in talking about whoops, uh, excuse me, in talking about birds or in talking about chimpanzees. Uh, but when people started turning to human beings, uh, this is a well-known uh, photograph from the Depression, um, and thinking about what are the decisions people are making about women are, and, and parents are making about provisioning, people began to be a lot more uh, uncomfortable. Now, I want to give one brief example of the sociobiological perspective, and one that I think works particularly well. Uh, Sarah Hurdy did work uh, in the late 70s and early 80s um, on Hahnemann Langers and other, uh, well, the 70s work was on the Langers. And what she was looking at was the way in which trying to explain um, the responses and the whole system by which in a Hahnemann Langer troop, which had many breeding females and one dominant male, when a new male would take over a troop, one of the first things that he commonly did would be to kill the infants. And then the females would mate with him and would have new infants. And <clears throat> There was some d debate about how to interpret this, and Hurdy's explanation was that if you look at, the, at what goes on and which infants, first of all, which infants are actually killed by the male who takes over, um, and which ones are not, and what happens with regard to parent-child conflict, this makes a great deal of sense. The, what is happening is that males will come in and they will kill the infants of females that they were not able to steal copulations with before they had taken over. So if the female had only mated with the male who controlled the troop and never mated with the new male who took over, the new male who took over would kill her infant. But if occasionally that female had snuck off and copulated with the new male taking over, he would not kill her infant. Um, moreover, when the new male took over, um, one of the fastest ways to get females into estrus <clears throat> to, and to get them to, so that they can have new young uh, is, is to kill the infant. So that the females would go into heat again, they would have new young, this would be young that would uh, be the descendants of the, um, the new male that took over. Uh, hopefully then he could control the troop long enough for them to grow up before another male would come in. And so Hurdy was able to explain what was going on in terms of decisions about, for example, the females choosing 
to um, sneak off in the bushes sometimes and have copulations with males who are not the dominant male in their troop, and why that might occur, right, that it would have this benefit of the child, of the infant not being killed later on. Um, she was also able to explain why it was in the interest of the new male taking over, and why a female, particularly one of the things that she discussed was the, that females who were younger in age put up less of a struggle against the male when it would go to kill the infant than females that were older, right? Because the older females, there might be a higher risk that they, that they would not have um, another infant or come into estrus. So all of this complex pattern she was able to explain in looking at this material. Now, another area of um, this that takes our human evolutionary past as a legacy um, that has been fairly prominent on the anthropology side is in human behavioral ecology. And this takes as an assumption that um, individuals will seek to optimize their lifetime reproductive success. And human behavioral ecologists have focused in particular in looking at food acquisition, especially foraging, and in uh, social status and its possible links to signaling as a way, again, of improving reproductive success. Now, one of the examples in work done by Eric Smith at the University of Washington was to look at Inuit hunting group sizes. And one of the things that Smith found was that certainly for game that's best caught by a single hunter, such as geese and ptarmigan, um, that, that was very, a very good predictor of um, how hunting patterns would go. Men would go off and hunt singly, and, and that was the end of it. But for game that was best caught by a small group, particularly seals, um, in which the optimal number seemed to be three, he found that in fact, seals were often hunted by too many. Um, too, too many meaning um, over the optimum, right? Anywhere between four and eight. And one of the things that he found was that optimization was constrained by social interactions. That if a group of hunters were going, it was very difficult to say to the fourth or the fifth hunter, no, you can't come, when um, knowing when he would, when, when the last hunter would know that if he didn't go, he had a worse chance of bringing in seals if he went by himself than if he joined this group, even if he brought the, the optimal amount that each person would get down um, from that larger group. And this sort of captures one of the struggles that human behavioral ecology um, has had to deal with in the research that, that has been carried out by actually quite a number of scholars. This is a very uh, strong field in anthropology. Um, and that's how to deal with uh, suboptimal results. What are the explanations for this? Is this a way of signaling something that has to do with social status, which is a line uh, of uh, research that some scholars have pursued? Uh, and if so, then the question uh, rises of, well, how do we show if increase in social status then does lead to optimizing <clears throat> reproductive success? Uh, and, and again, as I said, that is a challenge. Most of the people who work in human behavioral ecology do research on foraging peoples or pastoral peoples. Uh, and that sort of makes uh, some of the stretches in thinking about reproductive success, I think, a little easier to, uh, to handle. Another area... Um, a very prominent area of research, having many people who work in the field, is the area of evolutionary psychology. And a key concept in this is that evolutionary psychology gets around the problems about determining whether current behavior is adaptive by shifting to the concept of adaptation. In other words, by asking um, what a particular feature or behavior was selected for in the past. So shifting to this assumption that it had to have been adaptive at the time that it was selected for, but being neutral on whether or not it confers any adaptive fitness today. And in particular, one of the things that evolutionary psychology does is that it raises this concept of the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. Um, it, it 
requires people when formulating hypotheses to think about the environment in which a particular adaptation arose and to think about the constraints and the limitations of what was going on then. Now, this is, again, one of, this is one of the places where this field is often criticized and challenged, <clears throat> because how do we know what the environment of a particular adaptation was? How do we know when a particular feature, particularly if you're talking about um, cognitive mechanisms, different uh, rules of thumb in the mind, how do we know when they evolved? It's often assumed that the environment of evolutionary adaptedness was um, our foraging past, which they often even want to take way back into the Pleistocene. Um, and as Leyland and Brown talk a bit about, this is something that is also problematic because there was variability across time and space uh, for foraging uh, foragers during the Pleistocene. But in addition, while it might allow us to say, okay, if we are adapted for um, a past that's a foraging past and we're living in agriculture or in state societies, we can expect that there might be a disconnect uh, between what our mind thinks is adaptive and what in fact is adaptive. Um, while it allows for that, it also raises the problem of we've been in, the, many societies have been in agricultural settings and even in, in getting towards state numbers for thousands of years, 10,000 years for agriculture and several thousand years, I think 6,000 or more, for example, for dairying, as I'll talk about in a moment. Um, isn't that enough for selection to have happened? Um, as we'll talk about, it is. Um, and this is something that the evolutionary psychologists uh, face as a challenge in putting forward some of their hypotheses. Now, um, this is a kind of experiment that evolutionary psychologists put forward in trying to show their um, that there are evolved cognitive mechanisms. Um, this is something that is reported by Lita Cosmides and John Tooby, who are leaders in evolutionary psychology based on earlier work done by Peter Wasson. And what they're arguing is that if you can take the same um, cognitive problem, the same logical problem, and people have different abilities to um, handle it depending on whether you're dealing with it in the abstract or whether it is something that's put in social terms. And that humans have an evolved cognitive mechanism that allow us to handle the same problem that we have so much difficulty with in the abstract to handle the same problem very well when it's a social problem. Um, in this example, what they would ask people who were in the experiment to do in the top, they were told they had a clerical job and that every person who has a D rating, um, then on the back of the document it should be coded three. And they say, okay, which of these do you need to turn over in order to decide if that's true, if every D has a three? And in doing the experiment, what they found was that only 25% of people got it correctly, answered it correctly. But when they shifted the problem to a drinking age problem, to a social problem, and said, okay, if a person is drinking beer, then he or she must be over 21 years old, which of these cards do you need to look at? 75% of people answered correctly. Logically, it's the same problem. It's the same if P then Q and make sure the rule isn't violated. But more people got it correct with the drinking age that what you need to know, look at is to check P, right, whether it's the D card or the drinking beer card, and to check the not Q, um, which is the 16 years old in the bottom one, but it's the seven card in the top, in the top example. And this is the kind of way in which they, the kind of data that they use to make the, the case, the reasonable case, that our brain is suited to different kinds of, of problems and that we're much better at detecting cheaters in social situations um, than we are at detecting cheaters in an abstract case. Now, the criticism of these legacy views, um, of viewing evolution as a legacy that is that we still that still influences our behavior today is that often these are just so stories like the Rudyard Kipling stories that 
the elephant's trunk is so long because it got it stuck and it had to keep pulling until it stretched out, and that's just so. And they don't have to be just so stories, as I think Hurdy's work shows and, and others' work has shown. But the problem has been to go out and to collect the kind of data that moves it from a just so story to something that's well documented requires a fair amount of work. And there, there is work that's been done in that area, but it is a challenge, even for evolutionary biologists who are working with species with much, much shorter lifespans, identifying adaptive behavior and quantifying it is is quite a challenge. The other question that arises is, where is culture? Where, where is culture in all of this? Um, and it's often treated as, as an extension of the phenotype, as just an extension of the phenotype. Um, there's no independent properties attributed to culture or its impact on human beings. Um, and one of the things for human behavioral ecology in particular, and especially evolutionary psychology, I mean, they've been maintained for decades now because they've been very well funded. Um, evolutionary psychology has been able to tie into funding through the National Institutes of Health um, because of the cognitive development work that, that, that they're able to speak to. And human behavioral ecology was able to do so because of, of one particular program officer at the National Science Foundation. Um, and now that he's retired, it will be interesting to see what happens. Um, so the last category that I want to talk about um, is evolution as process. Um, and thinking about evolution as a process of change in the cultural realm analogous to genetic change. Um, and this is an area that my own work is in. Um, and it requires that we think not just to say, well, if it happens in genetics, well, it must happen that way analogously in culture, but it challenges us to be far more specific and to talk about, well, what are the similarities and differences? Is there a, something that can be called a selection process? And if so, what's under selection? Um, and how does that work? Um, the first area of this I'm, I'm really only going to mention in passing because uh, Dennett talked about it in so much detail. I don't think he gave you the word memetics for it, but the whole concept about the meme, um, the idea as an information unit that is a selfish replicator, um, that uh, Stanford is uh, a cons the result of a conspiracy of memes to get us to pass on uh, our memes and other memes to each other, uh, is is something, as I said, that Dennett talked about. It comes from the work of Richard Dawkins. Um, and also, Susan Blackmore uh, has, has done a lot of work in this field. I, I love this image that she has of a world full of brains and far more memes that can possibly find homes. And so you've got these tree-like brains that have memes climbing and crawling and begging to get in them. But a more... Um, complex and interactive way of looking at this that tries to bring the genetics part and the cultural part back together is variously called gene culture coevolution or dual inheritance theory. And this is really starts with the premise that human behavior is influenced by both genes and by cultural units. Now, I'm saying cultural units because the, the, I've, I've listed here the most prominent scholars who are working in this field, and they, none of them agree on what to call the cultural units. Um, so Luca cavalli Sforza and Mark Feldman have sometimes called them seams, sometimes called them ideas, sometimes called them information. Boyd and Richardson sort of shift among those as well. Bill Durham has called them memes primarily, um, but will also call them ideas. So, so cultural units, right? Um, I tend to think of them as ideas. But, but I think you get the point. All of them have been working and trying to think about um, both formally in mathematical models and in empirical cases, what are the cases in which genes might influence human behavior somewhat more? What are the circumstances in which culture might influence it more? And where do they interact? When might they be neutral? There's a whole series of models that try and do this, but I think one of the hallmarks of this is the way in which it takes a cultural inheritance track 
quite seriously um, and thinks about the way in which history, specific history, matters, right? This is the tradition, um, a cultural tradition. This is the, the um, social environment, if you will, the cultural environment in which things go on. And these scholars have thought about the analogy to natural selection in the cultural realm, sometimes called cultural selection, um, thinking about the issue of, of guided variation, um, really which is a fancy way of talking about trial and error learning, that if you do something and it doesn't work, you're going to try something else, and you do that other something else and it works, well, you're going to keep doing that. Um, and that this is a process by which people choose the kinds of behaviors that they're going to follow. But that's not the only way that we do things. Um, there are also various kinds of bias transmission that we um, decide to behave in a particular kind of way um, because we have a preference for it, because we want to do it that way. Now, under, uh, uh, discovering the underlying influences on that kind of a bias transmission is more complex. And some have posited that there are genetic predispositions or um, what, what Bill Durham has called primary values that may be at play in some restricted kinds of choices. So for example, the desire to eat salty or sugary foods that those are choices that might have some kind of underlying genetic influence. Um, but there are other things that can influence uh, the kinds of, of choices we make about what kind of behavior to do. Social conformity is one. Um, that this is something that other people are doing, and some of the models look at this specifically in terms of a frequency-dependent bias. Do you do it if X number uh, or X proportion of, of your group is doing it, and not if below that proportion is? Um, also looking in terms of, well, if somebody high in rank is doing it, am I going to follow that? Um, so there's a number of different models that are trying to think about the ways in which the cultural um, uh, ideas and, and values might be selected among. Another one that, that Durham has also talked about is the secondary value selection, the way in which meanings and beliefs might influence which other meanings or ideas that we are willing to accept or to enact. And as I said, um, scholars have tried to put these together in terms of thinking about the interactions between this cultural world and uh, the genetic world, the example of the development of dairying and the development of um, the gene that allows us, that allows adults to digest milk is something that's been studied by quite a number of scholars, including Durham um, and Feldman and Cavalli Sforza. And I'm not, since I'm getting down to uh, the end here, I'm not going to go into that example in detail, although uh, that's something we can talk about in the, afterwards in the question session if you would like to. One of the things that I want to end um, with, I have a couple more comments to make. Um, this is thought of as gene culture coevolution, but in very recent years, the last couple of years, people have started to talk about expanding this, so that, to talk about four different tracks. Um, John Odling Smee, Kevin Leyland, and Mark Feldman um, have proposed that there is an ecological inheritance track uh, in it with a principle that they call niche construction. Uh, thinking about the environment as something that organisms contribute to and build. So that, for example, the way in which um, a termite mound is built by individual termites, but then it is the environment for other termites that are born into it. Similarly, uh, Durham and myself, and um, coming from a very different direction, Joan Roughgarden, have started to talk about a social inheritance track. Roughgarden talks about uh, social, uh, social selection, not particularly an inheritance track, but I think it's uh, compatible with the way in which this is being discussed. And so um, these are things that we're trying to think about. Are there selection processes that are going on? Um, how do we disentangle the influences of ideas, for example, from structural effects of society? This is something from my own work. 
um, one of the things that, one of the examples that I found was uh, in 1930s Taiwan interviewing people about uh, a spirit medium role, which was very important in a local village. And even though it was a widely held belief in the community that the role ought to be held by women, the role passed to men, in large part for structural reasons. I interviewed the woman who uh, the last woman spirit medium had wanted to train, and marriage form was changing so that women were had no longer had the option of having a husband brought in for them. They were going to marry to their husband's household. And this woman said, who was going to take care of my kids? Um, the implication being that her sisters-in-law, she could not have asked her sisters-in-law to take care of her children when she went out to fulfill the obligations and duties of the spirit medium, although um, had she been able to, ten year, as 10 years before, have a marriage in her own home, her own sisters or her own mother uh, would have been willing to do that. So these are ways in which the choices and decisions that people make are affected by structural factors rather than just ideas. So in trying to think about evolutionary sense and nonsense and the ways in which the social sciences and anthropology and sociology in particular respond to this, there's a number of things to keep in mind. One is this fear and bias because of the history of eugenics that came from um, a movement that claimed to be Darwinian um, and that is in the popular mind affiliated with Darwin. Um, there's also um, internal disagreements among people working in the evolutionary field over the adaptiveness of modern and human behavior. Um, is it adaptive or not, and how would we show that? Um, and some tension between people who do empirical studies versus those who do more formal modeling. But I think there are very exciting prospects. Um, this addition of the two new uh, uh, inheritance tracks that people are working on, there's more and better data on interactions between all of them, um, and there's quite a lot to do. And it's, so it's, it's a time where it can be a little frustrating, but it's very exciting. And I think that you'll hear a lot more about uh, evolutionary theory in the social sciences in the years to come. Thank you. Okay, we move now to the part of the evening where we have discussants. And I'm going to ask the discussants if they can to be relatively brief uh, so that we can leave uh, sufficient time for questions uh, from the audience, since I'm sure that this discussion has stimulated a large number of questions on your part. Uh, given its breadth and depth and fascinating interest. Um, the first discussant is Professor Bill Durham, who was introduced on the first night, but if I'm going to introduce the other discussants, I need to say at least a little bit about Bill. <laughs> um, he's the uh, Bing Professor in Human Biology and is also in the Department of Anthropology. He's really a human ecologist who focuses on indigenous resource management, on human health, and on conservation issues in the tropics. Uh, as Melissa Brown noted, he has been one of the leaders in developing uh, a particular track within cultural evolution and its relationship to biological evolution. Beyond that, he's interested in the environmental causes of emerging infectious diseases in tropical areas, in conservation trade-offs in the Galapagos, and in ecotourism as a means to poverty, alleviation, and self-determination among indigenous and local peoples. But the relevance tonight is his interest in cultural evolution and its connections to uh, biological evolution. Bill? Great. Thank you, Carol, and thanks, Melissa for that delightful and encompassing presentation. Melissa began with two questions, you'll remember. Uh, why is Darwin not more widely accepted in social sciences? And what can be done about that? Should anything need to be done about that? What she then proceeded to do was, I thought, just a grand tour of Darwin's descendants, intellectual descendants, in and evolutionary models or theories in the realm of understanding human social behavior. It was a masterful tour. If you've been in the field um, for a few years, you realize how difficult it is to run all the way from Francis Galton through evolutionary psychology and up to uh, memetics and so on. Impressive to do that in the time she did. The other thing that I like about what Melissa did tonight is, folks, she told it like it is. You got the dirty laundry on evolution tonight. 
you got the other side of the story. It's easy to portray Darwin in grand and glorious terms. We have to remember that the theory has been used for all kinds of nefarious purposes. So let's turn to the question of how did evolution get the bad name? Um, Melissa pointed out it could be from what you read. If you read The Descent of Man, which is sloppy science, you get a different impression. Could also be from the classical evolutionists, as they're called. She mentioned Lewis Henry Morgan, Henry Maine, and others. People who thought that evolution meant a progressivist trend, a stair step of stages through which you must pass. To a lot of my colleagues in anthropology today, when you word, use the word evolution, that's what they plug in. Forget common descent, common origin, they plug in progressivist view where things go from savagery to barbarism to Western Europe. That's the, the so tainted was the evolution word by the classical anthropologists. Melissa did a lovely job, I think, of uh, showing eugenics and how evolution was used to kind of justify eugenics. Ironically, even as that was happening, scholars in the name of population genetics were working away to show quantitatively how if you bring Mendel into Darwin, if you bring the notion of the gene into Darwin's theory, you end up disproving the possibility of a sterilization campaign doing what you want it to do. You end up disproving the effectiveness of a campaign to sterilize homozygote recessives or whatever you're after. And so what's interesting is there's a good case where I think evolution could have been used the other way, um, uh, that the real modern synthesis could have been used against eugenics. She then went on to selfish genes, to sociobiology, uh, to parental investment theory, to where you begin to think that life is all about fertilization, to all kinds of uh, crazy notions about human social behavior. And what I loved was the emergence of this wonderful question toward the end of her talk, where is culture? We could also ask the same thing, where is society? Because in all of these Darwinian descendants, the models of human social behavior left out what is really considered to be the sort of fundamental starting points of the social sciences, a theory of society being a structured entity with stratification, hierarchy, centralization, power and control of resources as integral elements. I mean, it's foundational. And in anthropology, the concept of culture. Um, that whole, that second track of information or that second information highway, as Dennett called it. You know, these are things that we've always thought in the social sciences were crucial from the get-go to include in a model of human behavioral, um, uh, uh, any theory of human behavior. So should anthro toss out Darwin and ignore evolution or should anthropology just throw open the door and invite in the kind of logic, the kind of processual view that Melissa talked about. Well, one way I like to think about this personally is to think of culture as a kind of a text. To think of the shared ideas that we have in our heads as a kind of a text, uh, uh, ideas that some of which we've written ourselves, we have original ideas, but some of which have come from others, from parents, from ancestors, from great books, from just the social tradition of a society. And the reason I like this is because it immediately leads to the question, who wrote this text and who edits it? Who's in charge of the text? And um, you know, who plays that role? Secondly, what interests do they have? And what power do they have if I disagree? What you realize is that culture, uh, when seen as a text, is inherently um, in informational, but it's also embedded in a structure, in a society. Uh, it's also inherently political. What we think, uh, the cultural system is inherently political. So what I'm hoping is that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We realize that a lot of terrible things have been done in the name of evolution, that most of them have been done without a theory of culture and with almost no theory of society. Um, but then to ask ourselves, are there appropriate domains? Thinking of culture as a text, texts evolve. Did you know that long before there was an evolutionary theory for species, there were evolutionary theories for texts. That philology was the study of text derivation. So what I'd like to do with that analogy is simply to suggest that time really has come for a new synthesis. But for a synthesis that welcomes Darwin in the front door, 
I've been introduced at universities where I've been introduced to the person that's going to talk about the E word in social science. Evolution deserves a legitimate place. It's nothing to hang our heads about. And by evolution, we, need a, we mean something very processual, the editing of the text. We don't mean how genes control human behavior. So what I'd like to say is, let's get it right this time. Let's use models of Darwinian variational evolution. Let's use what we understand about society as a structured system. Let's not use Mendel's terms. The whole problem with bias transmission, as we've as, as Melissa hinted at tonight, bias transmission makes it sound like, you know, you're sort of passing along uh, germ cells and something biases them. We need to use Darwinian vocabulary. We need to talk about selective processes. We need to understand the biases and the values that are used. And we need to understand who is authoring, um, who is authoring the selection, who is, who is doing the editing. Yes, I think we need more tracks. I think we need the social. I think we need the ecological. But basically, I think the way forward is not to turn our backs on Darwin, but to invite him in the front door and really have an evolutionary model that includes the cultural and the social. So thank you, Melissa. I think there's probably a lot of points on which we agree, but I say, boy, let's do it right this time. Thank you, Bill, for that masterful. <laughs> Uh, response and summary. Her second discussant comes from a slightly different background and a slightly different perspective than Bill Durham has. Uh, professor Michael Hanahan is the Stratacom Professor of Management in the Graduate School of Business. He's also a professor of sociology here at Stanford. Uh, and at the same time, as if that wasn't enough to keep him busy, he has a part-time position uh, as a professor of organization and theory and theory back. Professor of Organization Theory at Durham University uh, Business School in the United Kingdom. Uh, his interests are how do organizations change? So he looks at both formal theoretical treatments of organizational change and also empirical studies looking at the emergence and the change and the dissolution of populations or groups of organizations. Uh, he has the recipient of a number of honors, including being a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he's had, held fellowships in a number of institutes, including the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Study, um, the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, and a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences up here on the hill outside of Stanford. Uh, he's also published a recent book on the logic of organization theory audiences, codes, and ecology, which gets at a lot of the different buzzwords that have been tossed around tonight. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a pleasure to be part of this group. I had a feeling listening to uh, Melissa's extremely interesting lecture and then Bill's commentary that, I, that the organizers picked uh, the wrong third wheel for this because I don't really disagree in any interesting way from, from what you've heard so far. So let me just say, a bit from a sociologist's perspective um, about, about the issue we're discussing. I think Melissa uh, paints uh, exactly the right picture, uh, and Bill seconds it, and so I'm the third voice, about uh, the reception of evolutionary thinking, Darwinianism, in, in sociology. Uh, at least for generations like mine, uh, this was a, uh, you know, this was a, there was a taboo. I mean, a serious taboo against uh, Darwinism um, for the reasons that Melissa described. Uh, sociologists also felt guilty because we claimed Spencer as a forefather, mm. and he, you know, he, he did the dirty deed in a lot of ways. I mean, what sociologists complain about social Darwinism, but as the, as the book that we recommended points out, it should really be called social Spencerism. Um, and um, so we're, we're stuck with, uh, with that legacy. So if we're thinking about evolutionary legacies, we have this kind of legacy problem here from the, the social science side. But uh, perhaps younger sociologists are not as uh, smitten by this anti-Darwinism. I mean, I sense more openness, and, uh, and that's a hopeful sign. 
I think the openness partly comes from the fact that I think now young so social scientists read the origins, not the descent, and that's what they should be reading. Um, and, you know, we also should point out that all kinds of brilliant scientists have done lots, published lots of crazy ideas, and what we do in science is to try to pay attention to, to the valuable insights and try to ignore the rest of it. Don't forget, for example, that Newton spent much of his life doing alchemy research, right? And we don't say, oh, I don't know about this Newtonian idea, this guy was an alchemist, right? Um, but unfortunately, Darwin is such a, a giant intellectual in a relatively modern period that it's hard to, it's been hard for us collectively to take, to take that view and uh, focus on, on, on what's valuable. For uh, sociologists uh, take very much the, the view that Bill just painted, which is that starting with the, that it's a mistake to start with the notion that we ought to build a theory of social, long-term social change that's as close as possible to some uh, Darwinian evolutionary story. Um, rather, I think the productive approach is to say, what is there in Darwin's uh, corpus that helps us accomplish the tasks that we set for ourselves? And, and there, it seems to me, it's all about the third of, of Melissa's ca uh, categories. It's about process, about trying to model a process of change. And from a sociological point of view, there are very durable bits in social structure parts that change very slowly and, and takes enormous collective pressure to change those bits. And this is the, you could think of this as the, as the elements of tradition that have some kind of binding power. As long as you have those very durable bits, these are, the, these are this is material that can, that can be transferred uh, in a somewhat evolutionary way. And so our job is to model selection um, in a, in a kind of rich context. The context is rich because in complex societies we have many multiple levels mediating between individuals and some final kind of social output. Um, and most of the work that, that tries to bring genes into the picture is thinking about a genetic leash on culture, which, which is a kind of a one-step leash, but, but really it's a much more complicated problem. So Bill's notion is that we, we might think of culture as a text. Um, a lot of the work I do currently very much fits that picture, except that we'd say that there are lots of texts floating around. There's not a canonical text. It seems to me there's not a canonical text. Um, work on cognitive anthropology seems to push very much in that direction, even for fairly simple um, societies, or small societies, I guess we should call them. Um, sociologists are more smitten with the metaphor that social structures are networks, and there's an enormous amount of research uh, at the moment in, in sociology on network structures as basic building blocks and, and attempts to try to understand what we could think of as the evolution of network structure. So I agree that uh, that um, we shouldn't give up hope that, that sociology will indeed let uh, evolution in the front door, as Bill says. Thank you. Melissa, if you would like to respond very briefly, otherwise we'll open the floor to discussion. I, I think we're largely in agreement. I think we can open the floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at this point, if you have questions, there's two microphones, one on each side. Okay, yes. Hi, I had a quick question concerning the 2004 sterilizations in Peru. Given how much change there's been in the population genetics framework and that we now understand that this doesn't work, why is this still continuing as a policy direction in the modern world? That's a really good question. I think part of what that shows is that it's really not it's really not a genetics issue, and it never was. It's always been about politics, right? It's always been about um, 
trying to reduce or control certain kinds of populations and, and prejudices and biases against certain kinds of people. Um, certainly Fujimura and his government would have had access to, to the genetics that would have told him it wasn't going to work. Um, I mean, that would be my response. I don't know if... <coughs> I think that's, yeah, pretty straight. Yeah. Straightforward. Yes? Hi. Um, yeah, just the context of survival of the fittest, and maybe for you guys to kind of discuss or try to define uh, fittest in terms of how Darwin would see that and then how the social sciences might differ in terms of that designation. Okay. Do you mean how Darwin would have defined it or how it's defined in the neo-Darwinian synthesis? Well, just, just <laughs> the tension between some of that and in terms right. of, yeah. Okay. Spencer's notion of, of fitness had to do with, with that scala natore and, and being the best. So that's where we get the kinds of intuitive models that your evolutionary biology teachers have all told you that you must not think about when you're thinking about fitness in the neo-Darwinian synthesis. That absolute sense of it's the big, strong, tough guy who's the one who's the fittest. And the evolutionary biology teacher reminds you, no, 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 no. It's the guy who has the, who, who has the most kids. And if it's the big, strong, tough guy who goes off to war and gets himself killed, and the guy who um, is a geek who stays at home and gets married and has six kids, it's, it's not the big, strong, tough guy who's fit in the neo-Darwinian sense, right? But in the Spencerian sense of, you know, the best in, in this absolute sense, they would have identified the big, strong, tough guy as the best. That, that's, does that help? I, I'm sure we can become more technical if, if, you, if you want. Um. Well, I, I was just thinking in terms of the, the social aspect of um, societal, cultural evolution, that's ideas that um, survive in a sense, right, versus I think one of the one of the breakthroughs in doing a dual inheritance and then moving up to a sort of other uh, uh, other tracks, other lines of evolution, we've had to recognize that there are several kinds of fitnesses and there are several entities with fitness. I actually think this was one of the breakthroughs that sociobiology never made. Sociobiology, everything was measured in terms of a Darwinian fitness, the you know success at survival and reproduction, and everything was measured in those terms. If you move into the cultural track, if you really take seriously Dennett's suggestion that with culture we have a second information highway, there are entities in that highway that also will have fitness. Well, what kind of fitness is that? We call it cultural fitness. It's success at replication. It's success at staying alive culturally, if you catch my metaphor. In other words, it's being success at being transmitted, success in replication. You could similarly define success in, a, in the social track of inheritance as a successful duplication across time of a social structure. There are lots of ways to do it. But you see, in each case, it has to do with the um, selective retention of a feature by virtue of some property. In Darwin's terms, it's by virtue of its survival and reproduction advantage. In the cultural track, it would be that it's it retained because of its replication success and, and so on. So uh, to make a long story short, what we've done is realize that there's not just one fitness, that there are entities with fitness probably in each of the tracks, and we're just needing to get more sophisticated at how we study and approximate measuring those amounts. As soon as you admit that there's a, another kind of entity with fitness in the world, a cultural entity with fitness, you're already thinking, dual inheritance because you've got the genes and their fitness and you've got ideas and, and their replication success. And then you realize that sometimes ideas uh, replicate that challenge your adaptability in terms of a Darwinian model. So then you get tension between the two tracks and that's when life really begins to get interesting. When is it that culture convinces us to do something that is really dangerous, like smoking for a very good example? How does that happen? what leads us down the primrose path and makes something successful replicating culturally when it's dangerous to survive and reproduction. And that's when it all gets very exciting and that's why several tracks of inheritance, each with a fitness measure, makes uh, for much better models of evolutionary process for people.
Yes? Is this working? Um, I was curious. Um, one of the contemporaries of Darwin would be, I would imagine, someone like Karl Marx, right? Engels and so forth. How before, I guess the Europeans had a much more receptive view of the Marxist theories. How does the Marxist kind of explanation, even though it's supposedly uh, not popular today, um, how does that fit in with the question of um, adaptation, change, punctuated equ equilibrium in terms of revolutions, and survival of the f or some kind of fit, for example, how would you explain the queen mother in England? Why the monarchy survives or not survive? Anyway, I'll just take that. So, so I, I would say that uh, you could use uh, Melissa's lecture to, to develop one way to think about that. So the, the classic Marxian theory is a theory of potential. Um, it's the unfolding of, a, of an, an inevitable uh, sequence uh, over you know, human societies. And in that sense, it's very antagonistic to, to a Darwinian notion uh, where there's, ran, you know, important randomness in, in these paths and, uh, and no clear overall direction. In fact, it's often uh, considered a classical evolutionary account. It's back there in the same, it's not savagery, barbarism, civilization, uh, but it has a similar uh, proletarian revolution, and we're going to have a you know socialist outcome, and uh, there's a kind of a tracking of um, of society through stages that, in fact, people reject. Now, do we reject the materialism? Um, there is another kind of level at which Marxian theory can be used and understood, and I think Melissa was addressing some of that and talking about uh, social relations, power relations, and that sort of thing. Right. So, if you if you look at Marx himself, it's more problematic because he thought Lewis Henry Morgan had it right um, and, and that the stages were right and they, they don't use savagery, barbarism, etc. Marx and Engels renamed them but that's basically the way it is and I, I remember my first trip to the People's Republic of China when I was doing field research um, social scientists there have to learn Morgan stages and the names that Marx and Engels gave for them and identify the minority peoples that they work with and place them in those particular stages. Um, so it's, I mean, that's the way the, the orthodox Marxist view of it is. On the other hand, Marx's insights about the ways in which um, power stratification works and the constraints that structures put on individuals, uh, I think, are, are very useful in thinking about, about um, the potential um, selection pressures that are going on in a social track. So I think that, that Marx's theory can be used as an inspiration for drawing ideas on to try and rethink some of this, but, but you've got to step away from the Lewis Henry Morgan stages uh, in order to do so. Uh, I think this person on the, my right, your left, was next, and then we'll switch sides. <laughs> You've made a convincing argument that Darwin was a man of his time and place, and certainly subject to the um, biases of uh, men of his generation and, and his social class. On the other hand, you could also argue that Darwin was pretty progressive for his time and place. He was a fervent abolitionist, and in fact, there were anti-slavery um, champions on both sides of his family. So my question is, what do you think Darwin himself would have thought of social Darwinism in general mm -hmm. and the eugenics movement in particular? Well, I only know a little bit about uh, some of Darwin's actual responses. I mean, he, he the, the full swing of the eugenics movement didn't really happen until after his death. Um, but he did know, I, I mean, Galton was his cousin, and Galton discussed some of these ideas with it. Um, and, you know, at least to the, to the degree that I'm aware of, I think Darwin had some ambiguous feelings about it. I mean, he thought some parts were right, and I, I, don't, know, I don't know how far he took it. Bill, I think you're far more familiar with Darwin's responses on these than I am. What? Well, one of the things I think we can say in Darwin's behalf is he had no clue about inheritance. Um, he, he really had only the vaguest notions from sort of plant experiments and things of the time that were only in intuitions. 
so much of what happened were the, when the rediscovery of Mendel and the eugenics laws in the first decades of this century was a pernicious use of the rediscovery of Mendel and Mendel's laws and the understanding of recessive alleles and how can we get at them and clean the gene pool. Uh, personally, I think Darwin's value system would have found those ideas horrifying, but I think uh, we can say that, um, you know, it was such a foreign concept to him because he had no idea of the way inheritance works, that it was not possible for him to think of purging a gene pool of its recessive alleles. I just don't think that's a question. Uh, I think he disagree with it, but I think we can say that comfortably that he was blissfully unaware of how that would take shape later with the rediscovery of Mendelian inheritance. On this side. Hi, I really enjoyed the presentation, but a question occurred to me during that I, I don't know if you have any opinion upon this. So what is being done today um, to stop the spread of social Darwinism through our culture? Because I notice that, for instance, a lot about economics seems to be talking still about social Darwinism, specifically this idea of third world, second world, and first world countries. And while we don't talk about races any longer, it seems like a lot of the fighting that seems to go on in the world is talked about in racial terms instead of talking about in, e is in economic terms. And I'm wondering, why aren't we saying this is wrong or that maybe this is biased in our general view as viewing ourselves as a first world country and somewhere else as third world? Mm -hmm. And also in a similar line, it seems like many of the theories we talk about seem to be centered still coming from Western Europe and the United States and Western countries. And what kind of theories are coming out of other places, places we say are not first world? Um, those are good questions. Let, let me just address the second one briefly and then go back to the first one in, in the context of, of that. Um, as I said, the area of the world that I work in is Taiwan and China, and one of the things that happened in the last, of the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century in China as um, their society was falling apart, really, with being torn apart by imperialism, by economic failures, by a whole series of things, um, Chinese intellectuals had read Darwin in translation, and they thought that they had, um, that they were on the bottom of the rung of the Darwinian, of social Darwinism. They accepted it. Um, in fact, I've got this, this wonderful Chinese scroll that has a picture of Darwin in this calligraphy writing below, and he, he, the way they have him portrayed, he kind of looks like God. Um, and <laughs> talking about progress, though. Um, and because in the first Chinese translation, uh, evolution was originally translated as progress. Um, and so, so these ideas are, are tremendously important in part because they became accepted in many parts of the world. And you can argue whether that's because of imperialist imposition or whether that was a, a, an entire a, a free acceptance by peoples in other parts of the world. But for whatever reason, it was embraced. Um, and, and that has influenced what their own thinking is today. Um, in terms of why people aren't responding, I guess I would say people are, uh, but that it hasn't been labeled as social Darwinism. Um, I think, at least for my own response, while I certainly <laughs> donate to organizations that try and oppose some of these kinds of measures, I wouldn't want to get up and, set and start calling social Darwinism out because it's such an incendiary statement and then people would say, oh, but you do evolution, you must be a Darwinist too. I just, I guess I don't want to go there with those terms. Um, but you're right, it is very disturbing and you do see that in, in some of the, the popular ideas, um, you know, clashes of civilizations and, you know, the primacy of, of um, trickle-down economics, although I think we're seeing uh, that that, uh, that experiment didn't work. Um, <laughs> So, so, I mean, I, one of the things that you do see scholars do, one of the things that I'm actually very proud of, is that the initial formal modeling of the gene culture coevolution was done by Luca Cavalli Sforza and Mark Feldman in order to respond to Arthur Jensen's work in the late 1960s trying to argue that IQ 
um, was correlated with race. And they developed the cultural models to show that you could get the kinds of distributions of um, test scores without any genes whatsoever being involved, strictly by cultural transmission. Um, so that was, in a sense, these models originated in a social response to, um, to, to a very negative use of, of eugenic kinds of and social Darwinist kinds of positions. Personally, I like what Mike referred to earlier of shifting the terminology and calling it social Spencerism. And I, I just <laughs> yes. really think that, you know, Darwin was later to regret that adoption of survival of the fittest for a lot of reasons. It doesn't capture really the, the Darwinian evolution is variational change, change dependent on variance. And, you know, the idea of, of bringing in the survival of the fittest, among other things, it caused just an enormous headache for evolution because Darwin suggested that fitness could be measured by the number of surviving offspring. So then you had survival of the survivors. The whole thing seemed tautological. They just, uh, that, that one importation caused so much trouble um, in evolutionary theory. So basically, I, uh, you know, I'd say let's get that out of there and, and uh, try and get back to what Darwinism is really about. And as a biologist, I would also add I'd like to see it get out of there because some of the words don't mean the same thing that they meant back in the 1800s, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that really confuses matters. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the last question over here. Yes, this is a huge topic, I know, but I'd appreciate some elaboration. I was very interested in some of the controversy, the questioning about some of Darwin's original notions about sexual selection and uh, what sort of scientific consensus is emerging <laughs> in that area, and particularly with regard to these different notions of fitness. Well, I, I will say something brief, and then I probably ought to let the biologists speak. Um, but I, I think. Well, what we're seeing with Ralph Garden's work is not is a challenge to to the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Um, in just that one piece of it, not the whole thing, but that one piece that draws most heavily on on the descent and talks about sexual selection, it's not something that is at all accepted at this point. Um, uh, Ruff Garden has published this book. She has another book coming out. She is published in Science. Um, if you look at her 2003, I think, um, article in Science and the and the letters in response, they're quite heated. Um, so it, it's it's a topic of current debate. It is not at all resolved. Um, I cert I personally find. Rough Garden's cases, I mean, I think in the book she's got 300 species, and I, I think when you get to having 300 examples that go depart from the received wisdom about what they ought to do, then there's a case for having to rethink things. But then I'm not a biologist. This really is a very long conversation <laughs> that you raised. Uh, and I should point out that the letters to the science after that 2003 article were longer than the article in terms of the number of pages that were taken. And interestingly, if you looked at the places where the people who wrote the letters came from, if somebody was from Oxford, Cambridge, Oxbridge, or was derived from Oxbridge School of Thoughts, they hated it. If they were from anywhere else in the world, they loved it. So there's some very interesting social phenomenon going on there as well. But I also would take issue with Melissa's comment that this challenges the neo-Darwinian synthesis, because I really don't think it does. I think that what Joan Refgarden is doing is saying, look, we have really taken the idea of competition too far here. We've taken some of the ideas of parental investment too far here. We've taken our constructions of gender and of sex roles too far here. And we need to step back and look at the data and see whether or not these data are consistent across the board with this very straightforward argument that comes forward in sexual selection, or rather there are different types of sexual selection. Do you have some situations where things that we're arguing have arisen due to competition for mates may have arisen due to cooperation in a completely different kind of a scenario? So she's arguing to expand the perspective that people have bringing to things. And she's calling a lot of what she does social evolution rather than, I mean social selection rather than sexual selection. Mm 
Now, I keep having arguments with her. I work on butterflies. I keep telling her my butterflies have no social structure. This isn't going to work for them. You're going to have to explain sexual selection and mate choice, or else you're going to have to cede this territory to me. And she's perfectly happy to cede the territory. So <laughs> I think that she brings up some very, very good points, but I think we're just at the beginning of exploring where this is going to go. And I think it's opening some really exciting times that are going to have influences on the social sciences, because after all, we're vertebrates. We have a social structure. If you're interested, the Evolution's Rainbow book is written for a general audience. So it refers to her, her um, professional papers in the end notes, but it's, it's written for a general audience. So you could read it and enjoy it, even if you have no biology background. Well, okay. One way to think about it, I don't want to prolong the discussion, but it does help to clarify, um, is, is the old question of what's the, what, what is the limiting entity on your survival and reproduction? Classical Darwinian sexual selection said access to mates and access to the gametes of the other sex. What uh, Professor Ruffgarden is pointing out is that it can be very well, that may be irrelevant. What really may be involved is access to postpartum care, postpartum access to resources, provisioning the young, that a lot of things beyond fertilization was have to do with uh, what's really affecting your ability to survive and reproduce. And if that's the case, then looking at it simply as what, is it, what do you need to get to fertilization is going to give you a, 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 it's going to leave out a lot of the richness and complexity of life. I mean, that's how I look at it. Yeah. That's one simple way to put it. And she also, I think, would argue that sometimes access to mates depends upon social structure. Yeah. And that, therefore, we need to be thinking about social selection and not necessarily just sexual selection. Which is why I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so great questions tonight, and I'd like to thank both the panel and Melissa Brown for a really stimulating discussion and evening. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.